All right. <clears throat> um, this is important. <clears throat> so I am not a professional brain person. I have a brain. But uh, I am an enthusiast and I'm an amateur enthusiast. So those of you who know more about the brain than I do, you can correct me later. <clears throat> but I want you to do something for me, uh, which I know is going to work. Uh, put both your hands on your knees. Okay. <clears throat> now, grab the hand of the person next to you and interlock your fingers with them. And then just rest your hand between the knees of the person you're sitting next to. Like you're, like you're in love with them and holding your hand. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Something interesting is happening. And I've got to get a little bit more time behind me. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right. Now, within now and the next five seconds, your brain is releasing oxytocin. And it's causing you to bond to the person that you're physically skin to skin touching you. That's why they put the baby on the woman's breast after the baby's first born. Uh, not because it's hungry, but because they want the baby to bond with the mother. And it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, so oxytocin is being released. Now, most of you <clears throat> have started to breathe deeper because in the last 10 seconds, you've started to release vasopressin, which is dilating your pupils, dilating your blood vessels, and expanding your trachea and the bronchioles that go into your lungs. And we're coming on to five more seconds, and most of you are probably feeling a little bit of a tension in your triceps and your biceps, and feels a little weird. And that's starting to release some endorphins and some encaphalins to make you feel more comfortable. It's a muscle relaxer, and so you're starting to feel more comfortable. <coughs> That's your brain. Now, what's interesting about that, and you can stop holding each other's hands. <coughs> <coughs> what's particularly interesting about that is that those are the same chemicals that you need to release to be able to be prepared to learn. Those are the things that put you at ease to make you feel comfortable, and that comfort is required to be able to experience deep learning. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to try to talk the story. I'm really terrible at this. But I want to tell you a story that's meaningful and life-changing to me. Uh, in 2002, I was in a board meeting. I had uh, started a firm called Prometheus Energy Company. It was an energy company. Um, and over the course of the next four years, it became very successful. And we had listed on the London Stock Exchange. And I was in a board meeting with our primary funders. And we had just arranged a very large funding for some projects that we were working on. My daughter, Rebecca, who's here in the front row, had uh, gotten ill and was in the hospital and uh, was at that point in a coma. And uh, her mom had the day shift and I would go from work uh, to the hospital and I would take the night shift. Uh, just before she went into the coma, her mom and I had both promised her that somebody would always be there with her. And so <clears throat> I was in my meeting and I got a call from my secretary. She came in and said, hey, you need to take this call. And uh, they came out and they said, hey, your daughter, uh, has had four strokes, you need to go to the hospital. So <clears throat> I went immediately to the hospital, and obviously she's in a coma, so she's not responding. And uh, they were talking to us about the coma or the strokes that she had just had. And this is by no means the end of our saga, but more like the beginning of a saga of multiple months of uh, her being unconscious and dealing with a uh, very tenuous thread of life. And eventually, through the miracle of blessings and absolutely angelic people who we didn't expect to come to our aid, who did, uh, she recovered. <clears throat> but in her recovery, <clears throat> she had lost her ability to walk, couldn't remember how to do that anymore, because the strokes had completely wiped out the association portions of her brain. And so she lost her ability to walk, to, to eat, to feed herself, to know how to lift the spoon up to her mouth, uh, to read. She was an avid reader. Um, <clears throat> all these things she'd lost the ability to do. 
And the reason why this story is so important is we had to reteach her. And it was extraordinarily hard. And it was really hard for her. And it was really hard for Jean and I to watch this. Uh, she uh, had her 18th birthday in a coma. So she's a bright kid going to the gym every day and uh, ready to go. Now we're teaching her how to walk again. And so <clears throat> we first thing we did is we went to the medical school library and bookstore and bought a bunch of books on neuroscience because we figured we're going to be able to figure this out and figure out how it works. <clears throat> and we really bathed ourselves in the ideas of learning. And uh, Jean and I decided that it was time for us to take a detour in our career path and do something different. So we had to start re-educating Bubba. That's her name. Her, her sister could never say Rebecca, so she started calling her Bubba. And so it's not a really attractive name, but we've called her Bubba ever since then. <clears throat> Um, so we started re-educating Bubba, and what we came across were a, a series of very interesting learning frameworks. And these were developed by David Kolb in 1975, and then a bunch of additions by Dewey and Piaget and others, uh, who you guys know much better about this than I do. And uh, the theory was, if we're really going to get her to be able to learn again, we need to follow these processes that people smarter than us were able to come across and learn from. And it would be an illusion to assume that we actually looked at these and, and charted a path from there. These really came after the process of trying to teach her some of these things. But what's interesting is that <clears throat> I have been a skeptic all my life about uh, sort of the soup du jour of ideas that come out of education on how to do things better this time. I don't know how many different math programs my kids have been through that I don't understand. Uh, <clears throat> but this seemed to have some theoretical foundation and sense to me. And when I look at the Come Follow Me stuff, it's amazing because it follows right in line with some of these, these principles. And the idea is, first we need to have a stimulus. We need to have an experience with data, with an idea, with reading, whatever. And then in order for, for learning to be truly enveloping and long-standing and understanding, uh, we have to reflect on it. We have to have the time to reflect on it. We have to have the ability to reflect on it. <clears throat> and then we have to create some sort of abstract thoughts or abstract ideas and begin the idea of testing. And then we move to active testing where we actually engage the motor parts of our brain. And it seemed like a linear process to me, but in reality, it became something that was a bit of a wheel. And the wheel was really, really laid out there for us because Rebecca's memory, her long-term memory was shot. She could remember everything before she went to the hospital but she couldn't form memories uh, about five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, a day ago. And so what we realize is that this is really a circle that keeps going on and on and on, and that this experience, reflection, abstraction, and active testing was something that we needed to keep rolling over and over and over again. And that's not because it's Becca, and not because she had the strokes, but it's because all of our minds work the same way. And what was amazing to me is as I was reading this material, I realized that this totally dovetails into neuroscience. And the idea is that <clears throat> the first thing we do is we sense things. And the sensory part of our brain here is just uh, behind the uh, central sulcus there. It says somatosensory cortex. Um, that's where all the stuff either comes in from the brain, through seeing, through tasting, through smelling, through touching, through positioning. Um, and then we do something with that. And ideally, we reflect upon it, and then those stimuli go into the back of the brain, into the association cortex there. And in that reflection, certain things take place, and we'll talk about those in a second. And then that stuff shoots right to the front of the brain, to the frontal association area, where we do some more working on it, and then we test it. And so all these ideas that seem to make some logical sense to me from education started to sit down into the neuroscience that I was studying, and it seemed to make great sense. And so <clears throat> what we found out is that the sensory cortex, which is how we feel stuff, we receive through sight, touch, smell, hearing, positioning, or taste, exactly follows right over to Kolb's ideas, and that's how we experience things. We rely on direct physical information from the rest of the world. And then when that stimulus goes to the back of the brain, that's where our memory formations are created. Now, this is where Becca's 
first problem was, back in her occipital load, on the left-hand side, one of the worst strokes completely destroyed that area. So <clears throat> she wasn't able to form these memories. Um, spatial relationships, couldn't ride a bike again. Um, <clears throat> this is where we integrate the, the uh, inputs and create images. This is where we recognize people's faces, where everybody can be so similar in their faces, but yet so different. This is where the facial recognition takes place. On the learning model, that perfectly relates with reflection. This is where we remember relevant information. We develop insights. We develop associations. And we start to analyze experiences. And then the next part, which is the front integrative cortex, right in the, right in the front of the brain. I brought a, one of my students' brains. <coughs> <coughs> the frontal cortex here, um, <coughs> that's where the front integrative cortex is, where we start to take those same ideas and we create short-term memories. We start to work on problem solving. We start to plan. We look at a problem and go, <gasps> I have no idea. This is, a, this is where accounting lives. Uh, this is where we start to plan how to lay out the debits and credits, how to balance the balance sheets. All that kind of stuff sits in there. We make planning judgments. Uh, we direct action. And then in the last part, sorry, let me take that over to the learning model. That is exactly the same as abstraction, where <clears throat> We start to manipulate images and languages. We develop our plans for the future. All these things started to dovetail. And then the last piece is the motor cortex, which is where we take the planning that we did in the frontal integrative cortex and we put it to work. And we do stuff. And the stuff doesn't have to be going out and building a house. It could be writing your notes down. It can be preparing a PowerPoint presentation. It can be <clears throat> doing a trial balance of your accounts in your accounting class. But without any one of these four things, learning never sticks. And learning never leads to understanding. You can shove as much as you want in to the sensory side and just try and shove everything you can into memory. But without the two integrative parts of your brain working and creating closure by active testing, you just won't remember it. And the brain is created this way on purpose so that we'll be able to respond to stimuli that are potentially dangerous to us. And that's how we create meaning. And so <clears throat> with this, I decided that what I was going to do is change some things. And the first thing I thought I would do is change my classes. And so <clears throat> I started with Math for Finance, which is like the great weed out course. This is where we try and scare everybody to death and um, make those who are unworthy unable to go into business. <clears throat> And so <clears throat> the purpose is to, to create problems in such a way that nobody can f do them. Uh, and then only the people who can clearly deal with abstract thought can be business majors. Um, <clears throat> so what I did is I backed it up and I said, no, I'm going to take this four-step pro process and build my whole class around it. And so I did that. And I created four steps for every single problem throughout the class. And I started with diagnosis. And the idea was, what is the stimulus that's coming into your head? What's the question? Diagnosis. <clears throat> the next one was setup. <clears throat> and you can start to see the reflection, remembering relevant information. So my setup phase was take the problem's information, create some sort of organization around it, move on to abstraction, be able to put that into a problem or a solution set, run the calculation, and then into the last one, which is the active testing, is what you're saying, OK, I'm going to interpret my, my question and, and give the solution to that. Um, <clears throat> in doing so, the scores in the Math for Finance class went up by 10%. Uh, we've lost the ability to weed out people in the class now because too many people are passing. Um, <clears throat> but it's become significantly better at being able to train uh, young people to be able to go through the math uh, that would prepare them for uh, some of the higher level classes in the, in the business program. Uh, what I'm trying to do now, and what has been much more difficult, <clears throat> is to create an environment where the higher division courses follow the same strategy. So if you look at the, <clears throat> the learning model to the right and the brain to the left, we now have a 410 class, which is investments, and a 360 class, which is financial statement analysis. And so <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is give them the sensory input online. So you would call it a flipped class, but it doesn't really look and smell and feel like a flipped class. 
but online I'm preparing videos for them to be able to watch so that the content is understood. And then when they come to class, the first thing they do is go to number two, reflection. They take a quiz. How well do you know this material? Are you able to deal with it? The next thing we do is make an abstraction. In other words, we get in together in groups, four or five people, and we work out a problem. Uh, we take an abstract problem, usually through a case. We used to do Harvard cases, but all their solutions are posted online. So we had to do our own cases. <clears throat> uh, so now we do our own cases, and they give a, get a chance to do abstractions. The next one is they have to present a PowerPoint presentation every day on what they learned and what their group learned. Um, and so they do active <coughs> testing. Now, it's difficult for me to say how this is working out because this is the first semester we're doing it, and I'm literally running every day to try and be ready for that day's class. And so next year, hopefully, I'll be more organized. Uh, but it's taken an, an immense amount of time and effort. Uh, but this is the model that I'm trying to uh, bring into the class. But what I've noticed is something very, very interesting, um, which I wouldn't have expected, <clears throat> and that is this is just like being a bishop. And I'm currently at the tail edge of, of my time as a singles word bishop. But what I've found is there are some very interesting things that are important to be able to create in a class. A safe and trusting relationship with the attuned other. Now those of you who are from the counseling world will recognize these pieces. They come right out of psychotherapy. But a safe and trusting relationship with the attuned other. I believe it's partially cultural inhibition um, that members of our faith don't raise their hand and jump up and answer questions. Uh, the cultural inhibition is obviously that people who answer questions are supposed to be inspired and that's the bishop and they're supposed to answer that and so whenever we ask a question they immediately turn their head down to the right or the left and they don't respond. And so creating a safe environment where they can respond, where they're expected to respond and where they can be really open uh, with their comments is really, really important. And the Come Follow Me stuff is amazing in this regard. And it's absolutely going to transform a whole new generation of, of young men and women in the, in the church. Um, <clears throat> maintenance of a moderate level of arousal. Now, part of the purpose of me telling the Rebecca story was that all of the interconnections that I talked about earlier, from sensory to the association cortexes of the brain and through to the, <clears throat> to the motor cortex, are all moderated by emotion, by the limbic system of the brain. And so I gave you an emotional story at the front. And it was meant to fire up your emotions a little bit, make it so that the stuff that you d discuss and talk about is more memorable. Um, activation of both thinking and feeling. Um, again, a tip to the limbic system of the brain. Uh, we've got to be able to feel about the things that we're learning and studying. There's a wonderful book that was written not about our church, but very applicable to ours, called Sticky Faith. Um, my first years in the bishop in a singles ward, um, I read this book, and it was written by members of another faith who said, 30% of the people we have who go through college stay in our faith, the other 70% we lose. And it's not because they don't know the stuff, it's because they don't feel it. Um, <clears throat> and so it's really important for them to feel uh, a language of self-reflection. Um, I think that's really important in our environment because culturally we have a very unique position. Uh, we got 73 different countries. Everybody feels a certain way, different way about learning. So in all of my classes, everybody calls me Carrie. Nobody calls me Brother Wasden. Nobody calls me Professor Wasden. Nobody calls me anything but Carrie, which is my first name. Uh, <clears throat> And the reason for that is I wanted to break down every single barrier that could possibly be put in place for them to not argue with me. I want them to argue, I want them to fight, I want them to feel at peace and at comfort to be able to share ideas. And I think that works, generally. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the other side is the reflection of a positive self. My experience here, I, I felt like I was grew up in a relatively dysfunctional family. Uh, but after I've been a bishop for a while, I was in the five-star family. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> the, the damage that so many of our young people come from in their homes is beyond any of my possible expectations. 
And I do believe that the environments that we create in the classroom are as valuable as the sacred environments of the bishop's office or a counselor's office. And the damage that has been done to so many of these young, wonderful people can only be cured by teachers who are willing to be able to open up that environment. One last thing, I know I'm done. I have a wonderful friend named Stephen Robinson who uh, does a lot of interfaith work uh, for the church. And uh, we took a group of our kids to his, to his house once and he gave a little fireside for us. And uh, he once had a Pentecostal minister come to his home and they, he went to church with him. Uh, there was some considerable question as to whether we were Christian or not, so he said, I'm going to take you to church. So he took him to church with him and spent the whole three hours, and they live on uh, the sort of bench between Provo and, and Orem, and uh, they walked the block and a half from their house to their church building. And the guy went through all three church meetings, and he came back, and he said, so what would you think? And his comment was, I believe that you're a Christian, that everything that I heard today was about Christ. And they had a few conversations about some other things. And he said, well, what questions do you have? And he said, <clears throat> I have one question. He said, uh, how many people get killed on your way to church? And he thought, none, why? He said, in every single prayer, somebody <laughs> blessed that we get home safely. He said, I walked the block and a half. There was no unsafe parts of that block and a half. What's it about? <clears throat> and the reason why I bring it up <clears throat> is because I think it's a huge problem for us in learning. We are constantly asking for safety, and that's the opposite of what we should be asking for. We're all going to die in the Lord's appointed time. So what we should be asking for is opportunity. And being able to create an opportunity where the kids that are in our stewardship have the chance to be able to completely grow and they'll never grow when all we're seeking is safety. And <clears throat> I'm trying to do that. Uh, I would, it would be very fair to say, I have some of my students in here who are saying, that's not my class. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but uh, we're trying to do that, and I think I'm hopeful that uh, within the next year we'll have things relatively well tied down to that end. Anyway, thank you. <clears throat>